Fourteen centuries ago, God sent down to humanity the Quran as a book of guidance. He called upon people to be guided to the truth by adhering to this book. Since the day of its revelation to the day of resurrection, this last divine book will remain the sole guide for humanity. The matchless style of the Quran and the superior wisdom in it are definite evidence that it is the word of God. In addition, the Quran has many miraculous attributes proving that it is a revelation from God. One of these attributes is the fact that a number of scientific truths that we have only been able to uncover by the technology of the 20th century were stated in the Quran 1400 years ago. Of course, the Quran is not a book of science. However, many scientific facts that are expressed in an extremely concise and profound manner in its verses have only been discovered with the technology of the 20th century. These facts could not have been known at the time of the Qur'an's revelation, and this is still more proof that the Qur'an is the Word of God. In order to understand the scientific miracle of the Qur'an, we must first take a look at the level of science at the times when this holy book was revealed. In the seventh century, when the Qur'an was revealed, Arab society had many superstitious and groundless beliefs where scientific issues were concerned. Lacking the technology to examine the universe and nature, these early Arabs believed in legends inherited from past generations. They supposed, for example, that mountains supported the sky above. They believed that the world was flat and that there were high mountains at its both ends. It was thought that these mountains were pillars that kept the vault of heaven high above. However, all these superstitious beliefs of Arab society before the time of the Prophet Muhammad, may God bless him and grant him peace, were eliminated with the Qur'an. The verse, God is he who raised up the heavens without any support, for example, invalidated the belief that the sky remains above because of the mountains. In many other subjects, important facts were revealed at a time when no one could have known them. The Qur'an, which was revealed at a time when people knew very little about astronomy, physics, or biology, contains key facts on a variety of subjects, such as the creation of the universe, the creation of the human being, the structure of the atmosphere, and the delicate balances that make life on Earth possible. Let us now take a look at some of the scientific truths revealed in the Qur'an. The origin of the universe is described in the Qur'an in the following verse. He created the heavens and the earth from nothing. This information given in the Qur'an is in full agreement with the findings of contemporary science. The conclusion that astrophysics has reached today is that the entire universe, together with the dimensions of matter and time, came into existence as a result of a great explosion that occurred in no time. This event, known as the Big Bang, 
produced the entire universe about 15 billion years ago, creating it from nothingness as a result of the explosion of a single point. Modern scientific circles are in agreement that the Big Bang is the only rational and provable explanation of the beginning of the universe and of how the universe came into being. Before the Big Bang, there was no such thing as matter. From a condition of non-existence, in which neither matter nor energy nor even time existed, and which can only be defined metaphysically, matter, energy, and time were all created. This fact, only recently discovered by modern physics, was announced to us in the Quran 1400 years ago. In the Qur'an, which was revealed 14 centuries ago at a time when the science of astronomy was still primitive, the expansion of the universe was described like this. And it is we who have constructed the heaven with might, and verily it is we who are steadily expanding it. The word heaven, as stated in this verse, is used in various places in the Qur'an with the meaning of space and universe. Here again, the word is used with this meaning. In other words, in the Qur'an, it is communicated that the universe expands. And this is the very conclusion that science has reached today. Until the dawn of the 20th century, the only view prevailing in the world of science was that the universe has a constant nature and it has existed since infinite time. The research, observations and calculations carried out by means of modern technology, however, revealed that the universe in fact had a beginning and that it constantly expands. At the beginning of the 20th century, the Russian physicist Alexander Friedman and the Belgian cosmologist Georges Lemaitre theoretically calculated that the universe is in constant motion and that it is expanding. This fact was proved also by observational data in 1929. While observing the sky with a telescope, Edwin Hubble, the American astronomer, discovered that the stars and galaxies were constantly moving away from each other. A universe where everything constantly moves away from each other implied a constantly expanding universe. The observations carried out in the following years verified that the universe constantly expands. This fact was explained in the Quran when it was yet unknown by anyone. This is because the Quran is the word of God, the creator, and the ruler of the entire universe. While referring to the sun and the moon in the Quran, it is emphasized that each moves in a certain orbit. It is he who created the night and the day, and the sun and the moon. They swim along, each in an orbit. It is mentioned in another verse, too, that the sun is not static, but moves in a certain orbit. And the sun runs to its resting place. That is the decree of the Almighty, the All-Knowing.
These facts communicated in the Quran have been discovered by astronomical observations in our age. According to the calculations of experts on astronomy, the sun is traveling at the enormous speed of 720,000 kilometers an hour in the direction of the star Vega in a particular orbit called the solar apex. This means that the sun travels roughly 17 million and 280,000 kilometers a day. Along with the sun, all planets and satellites within the gravitational system of the sun also travel the same distance. In addition, all the stars in the universe are in a similar planned motion. That the entire universe is full of paths and orbits, such as this one, is inscribed in the Quran as follows. By the sky, full of paths and orbits. There are more than 100 billion galaxies in the visible universe and each small galaxy contains approximately a billion stars. Furthermore, each big galaxy contains more than a trillion. Most of these stars have planets and most of those planets have satellites. All of these heavenly bodies move in very precise computed orbits. For millions of years, each has been swimming along in its own orbit in perfect harmony and order with all the others. Moreover, many comets also move along in the orbits determined for them. The orbits in the universe do not only belong to celestial bodies. The galaxies also travel at enormous speeds in computed planned orbits. During these movements, none of these celestial bodies cut across another's path or collide with another. Indeed, it has been observed that some galaxies pass through each other with none of their components touching each other. Surely at the time the Qur'an was revealed, humankind did not possess today's telescopes or advanced observation technologies to observe space in a range of millions of kilometers, nor the modern knowledge of physics or astronomy. Therefore, at that time, it was not possible to determine scientifically that space is full of paths and orbits, as stated in the verse. However, this was openly declared to us in the Qur'an that was revealed at that time because the Qur'an is the word of God. In the Qur'an, God informs us of a very important attribute of the sky. We made the sky a preserved and protected roof, yet still they turn away from our signs. This attribute of the sky has been proved by scientific research done in the 20th century. The atmosphere surrounding the earth serves crucial functions for the continuity of life while destroying many meteors, big and small, as they approach the Earth, it prevents them from falling to Earth and harming living things. In addition, the atmosphere filters the light rays coming from space that are harmful to living beings. It is a most striking feature of the atmosphere that it lets only harmless and useful rays, visible light, near ultraviolet light and radio waves pass through. All of this radiation is vital for life. Near ultraviolet rays 
which are only partially let in by the atmosphere, are very important for the photosynthesis of plants and for the survival of all living beings. The majority of the intensive ultraviolet rays emitted from the sun are filtered out by the ozone layer of the atmosphere, and only a limited and essential part of the ultraviolet spectrum reaches the Earth. The protective function of the atmosphere does not end here. The atmosphere also protects the Earth from the freezing cold of the space, which is about minus 270 degrees centigrade. It is not only the atmosphere that protects the Earth from harmful effects. In addition to the atmosphere, the Van Allen belt, a layer caused by the magnetic field of the Earth, also serves as a shield against the harmful radiation that threatens our planet. This radiation, which is constantly emitted by the sun and other stars, is deadly to living things. If the Van Allen belt did not exist, the massive outbursts of energy called solar flares that occur frequently in the sun would destroy all life on Earth. The energy transmitted in just one of these flashes detected in recent years was calculated to be equivalent to 100 billion atomic bombs, similar to the one dropped on Hiroshima. Fifty-eight hours after the flash, it was observed that the magnetic needles of compasses displayed unusual movement, and 250 kilometers above the Earth's atmosphere, the temperature suddenly increased to 2,500 degrees Celsius. In short, God's perfect system is at work high above the Earth. It surrounds our world and protects it against external threats. Scientists only learned about it recently, yet centuries ago we were informed in the Quran about the world's atmosphere functioning as a protective shield. The eleventh verse of Surat At-Tariq in the Qur'an refers to the returning function of the sky. I swear by heaven which returns. The word Raj, interpreted as return in Qur'an translations, has meanings of sending back or returning. As known, the atmosphere surrounding the Earth consists of many layers. Each layer serves an important purpose for life's benefit. Research has revealed that these layers have the function of turning the materials or rays that they are exposed to back into space or back down on Earth. Now let us examine with a few examples this recycling function of the layers encircling the Earth. The troposphere, 1315 kilometers above the Earth, enables water vapor rising from the surface to be condensed and turned back down to Earth as rain. The ozone layer, at an altitude of 25 kilometers, reflects harmful radiation and ultraviolet light coming from space and turns both back into space. The ionosphere reflects radio waves broadcast from the Earth back down to different parts of the world, just like a passive communication satellite, and thus makes wireless communication, radio and television broadcasting possible over long distances. The fact that this property of the sky's layers, which could only be scientifically discovered recently, was declared centuries ago in the Qur'an, once again demonstrates that the Qur'an is the Word of God.
One fact about the universe revealed in the verses of the Quran is that the sky is made up of seven layers. It is He who created everything on earth for you and then directed His attention up to heaven and arranged it into seven regular heavens. He has knowledge of all things. Then He turned to heaven when it was smoke. In two days He determined them as seven heavens and revealed in every heaven its own mandate. The word heavens, which appears in many verses in the Quran, is used to refer to the sky of the earth as well as the entire universe. Given this meaning of the word, it is seen that the earth's sky or the atmosphere is made up of seven layers. Indeed, today it is known that the world's atmosphere consists of different layers that lie on top of each other. Based on the criteria of chemical contents or air temperature, the definitions made have determined the atmosphere of the earth as seven layers. According to the limited fine mesh model, a model of atmosphere used to estimate weather conditions for 48 hours, the atmosphere has also seven layers. According to the modern geological definitions, the seven layers of atmosphere are as follows. 1. Troposphere 2. Stratosphere 3. Mesosphere 4. Thermosphere 5. Exosphere, 6, Ionosphere, and 7, Magnetosphere. The Quran says, He revealed in every heaven its own mandate. In other words, God is stating that He assigned each heaven its own duty. Truly, each one of these layers has vital duties for the benefit of humankind and all other living things on the earth. Each layer has a particular function, ranging from forming rain to preventing harmful rays, from reflecting radio waves to averting the harmful effects of meteors. The verses inform us about the appearance of the seven layers of the atmosphere. Don't you see how he created seven heavens in layers? He who created the seven heavens in layers. The Arabic word tibak in these verses, translated into English as layer, means layer, the appropriate cover or covering for something, and thus stresses how the top layer is well suited to the lower. The word is also used here in the plural, layers. The seven heavens in layers, as described in the verse, is without doubt the most perfect expression of the atmosphere. It is a great miracle that these facts, which could not possibly be discovered without the technology of the 20th century, were explicitly stated by the Quran 1400 years ago. The Qur'an draws attention to a very important geological function of mountains. We placed firmly embedded mountains on the earth so it would not move under them. As noticed, it is stated in the verse that the mountains have the function of preventing shocks on the earth. This fact was not known by anyone at the time the Qur'an was revealed. It was in fact brought to light recently as a result of the findings of modern geology. According to these findings, mountains emerged as a result of the movements and collisions of massive plates forming the Earth's crust. When two plates collide, the stronger one slides under the other, 
the one on top bends and forms heights and mountains. The layer beneath proceeds under the ground and makes a deep extension downward. That means that mountains have a portion stretching downwards as large as their visible portion on Earth. In a scientific text, the structure of mountains is described as follows. Where continents are thicker, as in mountain ranges, the crust sinks deeper into the mantle. In a verse, this role of the mountains is pointed out through a comparison with pegs. Have we not made the earth as a bed and the mountain its pegs? Mountains, in other words, clench the plates in the earth's crust together by extending above and beneath the earth's surface at the conjunction points of these plates. In this way, they fix the earth's crust and prevent it from drifting over the magma stratum or among its plates. The fixing effect of mountains is known as isostasy in scientific literature. Isostasy is the state of equilibrium between the upward force created by the mantle layer and the downward force created by the Earth's crust. As mountains lose mass due to erosion, soil loss, or melting of glaciers, they can gain mass from the formation of glaciers, volcanic eruptions, or soil formation. Therefore, as mountains grow lighter, they are pressed upwards by the raising force implemented by the liquids. Briefly, we may liken mountains to nails that keep wood pieces together. Alternatively, as they grow heavier, they are pressed into the mantle by the force of gravity. Equilibrium between these two forces is established by isostasy. Today, we know that the rocky external layer of the Earth's surface is riven by deep faults and split into plates swimming above the molten lava. Since the Earth revolves very quickly around its own axis, were it not for the fixing effect of the mountains, these plates would shift. In such an event, soil would not collect on the Earth's surface, water would not accumulate in the soil, no plants could grow, and no roads or houses could be built. In short, life on Earth would be impossible. Through the mercy of God, however, mountains act like nails and, to a large extent, prevent movement in the Earth's surface. This vital role of mountains that was discovered by modern geology and seismic research was revealed in the Quran centuries ago as an example of the supreme wisdom in God's creation. We placed firmly embedded mountains on the earth so it would not move under them. In one of the verses, we are informed that the mountains are not motionless as they seem, but that they are in constant motion. You see the mountains you reckoned to be solid going past like clouds. Such is the artistry of God, who disposes of all things in perfect order. Surely he is aware of what you do. This motion of the mountains is caused by the movement of the Earth's crust that they are located on. The Earth's crust sort of floats over the mantle layer, which is denser. It was at the beginning of the 20th century when, for the first time in history, a German scientist by the name of Alfred Wegener proposed that the continents of the Earth had been attached together at the initial phases of the world, but then drifted in different directions and thus separated as they moved away from each other.
Geologists understood that Wegener was right only in the 1980s, 50 years after his death. Discovered as a result of the geological research carried out at the beginning of the 20th century, this movement of the Earth's crust is explained by scientists as follows. The crust and uppermost part of the mantle, with a thickness of about 100 kilometers, are divided into segments called plates. There are six major plates and several small ones. According to the theory called plate tectonics, these plates move about on Earth, carrying continents and ocean floor with them. Continental motion has been measured at from 1 to 5 centimeters per year. As the plates continue to move about, this will produce a slow change in Earth's geography. Each year, for instance, the Atlantic Ocean becomes slightly wider. There is a very important point to be stated here. God has referred to the motion of mountains as drifting action in the verse. Today, modern scientists also use the term continental drift for this motion. Continental drift is something that could not have been observed at the time of the revelation of the Quran. God clearly indicated how it was to be understood. You see the mountains you reckoned to be solid in the verse. Though he described a fact in the following verse, stating that the mountains were going past like clouds. Clearly, the verse points to the movement of the layer in which the mountains are fixed. It is without doubt a great miracle that this scientific fact, only recently discovered by science, should have been revealed in the 7th century, when conceptions of the nature of the universe were based on superstition and myth. Iron is one of the elements highlighted in the Qur'an. In Surat al-Hadid, meaning iron, we are informed, He also sent down iron, in which there lies great force, and which has many uses for mankind. The word anzalna, translated as we sent down, and used for iron in the verse, could be thought of having a metaphorical meaning to explain that iron has been given to benefit people. But, when we take into consideration the literal meaning of the word, which is being physically sent down from the sky, as in the case of rain and sun rays, we realize that this verse implies a very significant scientific miracle. Because modern astronomical findings have disclosed that the iron found in our world has come from giant stars in outer space, since the temperature in the sun is inadequate for the formation of iron. The sun has a surface temperature of 6,000 degrees centigrade and a core temperature of approximately 20 million degrees. Iron can only be produced in much bigger stars than the sun, where the temperature reaches a few hundred million degrees. When the amount of iron exceeds a certain level in a star, the star can no longer bear it, and eventually it explodes in what is called a nova, or a supernova. These explosions make it possible for iron to be given off into space. All this shows that the iron metal did not form on the Earth, but was carried from exploding stars in space and was sent down exactly the same way as stated in the verse.
Astronomy has also revealed that other elements were also formed outside the Earth. In the expression, we also sent down iron, in the verse, the word also may well be referring to that idea. However, the fact that the verse specifically mentions iron is quite astounding, considering the discoveries made at the end of the 20th century. In his book, Nature's Destiny, the well-known microbiologist Michael Denton emphasizes the importance of iron. Of all the metals, there is none more essential to life than iron. It is the accumulation of iron in the center of a star which triggers a supernova explosion and the subsequent scattering of the vital atoms of life throughout the cosmos. It was the drawing by gravity of iron atoms to the center of the primeval Earth that generated the heat which caused the initial chemical differentiation of the Earth, the outgassing of the early atmosphere, and ultimately the formation of the hydrosphere. It is molten iron in the center of the Earth which, acting like a gigantic dynamo, generates the Earth's magnetic field, which in turn creates the Van Allen radiation belts that shield the Earth's surface from destructive high-energy penetrating cosmic radiation and preserve the crucial ozone layer from cosmic ray destruction. Without the iron atom, there would be no carbon-based life in the cosmos, no supernova, no heating of the primitive Earth, no atmosphere or hydrosphere, there would be no protective magnetic field, no Van Allen radiation belts, no ozone layer, no metal to make hemoglobin in human blood, no metal to tame the reactivity of oxygen, and no oxidative metabolism. This account clearly indicates the importance of the iron atom. It is clear that this fact could not have been known in the 7th century when the Quran was revealed. Nevertheless, this fact is related in the Quran, the word of God, who encompasses all things in his infinite knowledge. In addition, the 25th verse of Surat al-Hadid, which refers to iron, includes two mathematical codes. Surat al-Hadid is the 57th surah in the Quran. The numerical value of the word al-Hadid in Arabic, in other words, its abjad, is the same number, 57. The numerical value of the word Hadid alone is 26, and 26 is the atomic number of iron. An information provided in the Quran about rain is that it is sent down to earth in measured amounts. This is mentioned in Surat Az-Zukruf as follows. It is he who sends down water in measured amounts from the sky by which we bring a dead land back to life. That is how you too will be raised from the dead. This measured quantity in rain has again been discovered by modern research. It is estimated that in one second, approximately 16 million tons of water evaporates from the earth. This figure amounts to 505 trillion tons of water in one year. This number is equal to the amount of rain that falls on the earth in a year. Therefore, water continuously circulates in a balanced cycle according to a measure. Life on earth depends on this water cycle. Even if all the available technology in the world were to be employed for this purpose, this cycle could not be reproduced artificially. Even a minor deviation in this equilibrium would soon give rise to a major ecological imbalance that would bring about the end of life on Earth. Yet, it never happens and rain continues to fall every year in exactly the same measure, just as revealed in the Quran. The proportion of rain does not merely apply to its quantity, 
but also to the speed of the falling raindrops. The speed of raindrops, regardless of their size, does not exceed a certain limit. Philip Leonard, a German physicist who received the Nobel Prize in Physics in 1905, found that the fall speed increased with drop diameter until a size of 4.5 millimeters, or 0.18 inches. For larger drops, however, the fall speed did not increase beyond 8 meters per second, or 26 feet per second. He attributed this to the changes in drop shape caused by the airflow as the drop size increased. The change in shape thus increased the air resistance of the drop and slowed its fall rate. As can be seen, the Quran may also be drawing our attention to the subtle adjustment in rain which could not have been known 1400 years ago. One of the properties of seas that was very recently discovered is related in a verse of the Quran as follows. He has let loose the two seas, converging together, with a barrier between them they do not break through. This property of the seas that converge together yet do not mingle with one another at all has been very recently discovered by oceanographers. Because of a physical force called the surface tension, the waters of neighboring seas do not mix. Caused by the difference in the density of the seas, surface tension prevents the seas from mingling with one another, just as if a thin wall were between them. It is yet another scientific miracle of the Qur'an that during a period when people had no knowledge of physics, surface tension, or oceanography, this was revealed in the Qur'an. Until fairly recently, it was thought that a baby's sex was determined by the mother's cells. Or it was believed that the baby's sex was determined by the male and female cells together. But we are given a different kind of information in the Quran, where it is stated that masculinity or femininity is created out of sperm poured forth into the womb. That he created in pairs, male and female, out of a drop of sperm as it is poured forth. The improving disciplines of genetics and molecular biology have scientifically validated the accuracy of this information given by the Quran. It is now understood that sex is determined by sperm cells coming from the male and that the female has no role in the process. Chromosomes are the main elements in determining sex. Two of the 46 chromosomes that determine the structure of a human being are identified as the sex chromosomes. These two chromosomes are called XY in males and XX in females because the shapes of the chromosomes resemble these letters. The Y chromosome carries the genes that code for masculinity while the X chromosome carries the genes that code for femininity. 
Formation of a new human being begins with the cross combination of one of these chromosomes, which exists in males and females in pairs. In females, both components of the sex cell, which divides into two during ovulation, carry X chromosomes. The sex cell of a male, on the other hand, produces two different kinds of sperm, one that contains X chromosome and the other that contains Y chromosomes. If an X chromosome from the female unites with a sperm that contains an X chromosome, then the baby is female. If it unites with a sperm that contains a Y chromosome, the baby is male. In other words, a baby's sex is determined by which chromosome from the male unites with the female's ovum. None of this was known until the discovery of genetics in the 20th century. Indeed, in many cultures, it was believed that a baby's sex was determined by the female's body. That was why women were blamed when they gave birth to girls. Thirteen centuries before human genes were discovered, the Quran, however, revealed information that denies this superstition and referred to the origin of sex being not with women, but with the semen coming from men. If we keep on examining the facts announced to us in the Quran about the formation of people, we again encounter some very important scientific miracles. When the sperm of the male unites with the ovum of the female, the essence of the baby to be born is formed. This single cell, known as zygote in biology, will instantly start to reproduce by dividing and eventually becoming a piece of flesh. This, of course, can only be seen by human beings with the aid of a microscope. The zygote, however, does not spend its developmental period in a void. It clings to the uterus, just like roots that are firmly fixed to the earth by their tendrils. This bond enables the zygote to obtain the substance essential to its development from the mother's body. Here, at this point, a very significant miracle of the Qur'an is revealed. While referring to the zygote developing in the mother's womb, God uses the word alak in the Qur'an. Recite, in the name of your Lord, who created man from Alak. Recite, and your Lord is the most generous. The meaning of the word Alak in Arabic is a thing that clings to some place. The word is literally used to describe leeches that cling to a body to suck blood. Certainly, it is not a coincidence that such an appropriate word is used for the zygote developing in the mother's womb. This confirms once again that the Qur'an is a revelation from God, the Lord of all the worlds. While it is told in the Qur'an that it is easy for God to bring man to life after death, the fingerprint of man is particularly emphasized. Yes, we are able to put together in perfect order the very tips of his fingers. The emphasis on fingerprints has a very special meaning. This is because everyone's fingerprint is unique to himself. 
Every person who is alive or who has ever lived in this world has a set of unique fingerprints. That is why fingerprints are accepted as a very important identity card exclusive to its owner and used for this purpose around the world. But what is important is that this feature of the fingerprint was only discovered in the late 19th century. Before then, people regarded fingerprints as ordinary curves without any specific importance or meaning. However, in the Quran, God points to fingertips, which did not attract anyone's attention at that time, and calls our attention to their importance, an importance that could only be understood in our age. Another important aspect of the information mentioned in the verses of the Qur'an is the developmental stages of a human in the mother's womb. It is stated in the verses that in the mother's womb, first the bones develop, and then the muscles form, which wrap around these bones. We then formed the drop into an embryo, and formed the embryo into a lump, and formed the lump into bones, and clothed the bones in flesh, and then brought him into being as another creature. Blessed be God, the best of creators. Embryology is a branch of science that studies the development of embryo in the mother's womb. Until very recently, embryologists assumed that the bones and muscles in an embryo developed at the same time. For this reason, for a long time, some people claimed that these verses were in conflict with science. Yet, advanced microscopic research conducted by virtue of new technological developments has revealed that the revelation of the Qur'an is word by word correct. These examinations showed that the development inside the mother's womb takes place in just the way it is described in the verses. First, the cartilage tissue of the embryo ossifies. Then, muscular cells that are selected from amongst the tissue around the bones come together and wrap around these bones. This event is described in a scientific publication with the following words. During the seventh week, the skeleton begins to spread throughout the body and the bones take their familiar shapes. At the end of the seventh week and during the eighth week, the muscles take their positions around the bone forms. In short, man's developmental stages, as they are described in the Qur'an, are in perfect harmony with the findings of modern embryology. In the Qur'an, it is related that man is created in a three-stage process in the mother's womb. He creates you stage by stage in your mother's wombs in a threefold darkness. That is God, your Lord. Sovereignty is His. There is no God but Him. So what has made you deviate? The Arabic expression translated into English as a threefold darkness indicates three dark regions involved during the development of the embryo. These are a. the darkness of the abdomen, b. the darkness of the womb, and c. the darkness of the placenta. 
As we have seen, modern biology has revealed that the embryological development of the baby takes place in the manner revealed in the verse, in three dark regions. Moreover, advances in the science of embryology show that these regions consist of three layers each. The lateral abdominal wall comprises three layers. The external oblique, the internal oblique, and the transversus abdominis muscles. Similarly, the wall of the womb also consists of three layers. The epimetrium, the myometrium, and the endometrium. Similarly again, the placenta surrounding the embryo also consists of three layers. The amnion, the internal membrane around the fetus, the chorion, the middle amnion layer, and the decidua, outer amnion layer. It is also pointed out in this verse that a human being is created in the mother's womb in three distinct stages. Indeed, modern biology has revealed that the baby's embryological development takes place in three stages in the mother's womb. Today, in all the embryology textbooks studied in the faculties of medicine, this subject is taken as an element of basic knowledge. For instance, in Basic Human Embryology, a fundamental reference text in the field of embryology, this fact is stated as follows. The life in the uterus has three stages, pre-embryonic, first two and a half weeks, embryonic, until the end of the eighth week, and fetal, from the eighth week to labor. These phases refer to the different developmental stages of a baby. Information on the development in the mother's womb became available only after observations done with modern devices. Yet, just like many other scientific facts, these pieces of information are imparted in the verses of the Quran in a miraculous way. The fact that such detailed and accurate information was given in the Quran at a time when people had scarce information on medical matters is clear evidence that the Quran is the word of God. Another miraculous aspect of the Qur'an is its prediction of future events, all of which have so far been fulfilled. This is one of the proofs that the Qur'an is the word of God. The 27th verse of Surat al-Fat, for example, gave the believers glad tidings that they would conquer Mecca, which was then under the occupation of pagans. God has confirmed his messenger's vision with truth. You will enter the Masjid al-Haram in safety, God willing, shaving your heads and cutting your hair without any fear. He knew what you did not know and ordained, in place of this, an imminent victory. In close consideration, the verse is seen to announce yet another victory that will take place before the victory of Mecca. Indeed, as stated in the verse, the believers first conquered the Kaibar fortress, which was under the control of the Jews, and then entered Mecca. Another piece of news that the Qur'an gives about the future is found in the first verses of Surat al-Rum, which refers to the Byzantine Empire, the eastern part of the later Roman Empire. In these verses, it is stated that the Byzantine Empire had met with a great defeat, but that it would soon gain victory. The Romans have been defeated in the lowest land, but after their defeat they will themselves be victorious within three to nine years. The affair is God's from beginning to end.
These verses were revealed around 620, almost seven years after the severe defeat of Christian Byzantium at the hands of the Persians in 1613 and 1614, when the Byzantines lost Jerusalem. Yet it was revealed in the verses that Byzantium would shortly be victorious. In fact, Byzantium had then suffered such heavy losses that it seemed impossible for it to even maintain its existence, let alone be victorious again. Following their defeat of the Byzantines at Antioch in 613, the Persians seized control of Damascus, Kilikia, Tarsus, Armenia, and Jerusalem. The loss of Jerusalem in 614 was particularly traumatic for the Byzantines, for the Church of the Holy Sepulchre was destroyed and the Persians seized the true cross, the symbol of Christianity. Not only the Persians, but also Avars, Slavs, and Lombards posed serious threats to the Byzantine Empire. The Avars had come as far as the walls of Constantinople. The Byzantine Emperor Heraclius had ordered the gold and silver in churches to be melted and turned into money in order to meet the expenses of the army. Many governors had revolted against Emperor Heraclius, and the empire was on the point of collapse. Mesopotamia, Kilikia, Syria, Palestine, Egypt, and Armenia, which earlier belonged to Byzantium, were invaded by the idolater Persians. In short, everyone was expecting the Byzantine Empire to be destroyed. But right at that moment, the first verses of Surat Tarrum were revealed announcing that Byzantium would gain triumph in three to nine years. This predicted victory seemed so impossible that the Arab polytheists thought it would never come true. Like all the other predictions in the Quran, however, this one also came true. In 622, Heraclius gained a number of victories over the Persians and conquered Armenia. In December 627, a decisive battle between Byzantium and the Persian Empire was fought at Nineveh, some 50 kilometers east of the Tigris River near Baghdad. The Byzantine army defeated the Persians again. A few months later, the Persians had to make an agreement with Byzantium, which obligated them to return the territories they had taken from them. The Byzantine victory was completed when Emperor Heraclius defeated the Persian ruler Hasro II in 630, recaptured Jerusalem, and regained the true cross for the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. At the end, the victory of the Romans, proclaimed by God in the Quran, miraculously came true within the verses stated three to nine years time frame. Another miracle revealed in these verses is the announcement of a geographical fact that could not be discovered by anyone in that period. In the third verse of Surat Ar-Rum, we are informed that the Romans had been defeated in the lowest region of the earth. This expression, Adna Alart in Arabic, is interpreted as a nearby place in many translations. Yet this is not the literal meaning of the original statement, but rather a figurative interpretation of it. The word Adna in Arabic derived from the word Dani, which means low, means the lowest. The word art means world. Therefore, the expression adna al art means the lowest place on earth. The Dead Sea, one of the regions in which the Byzantines were defeated in 1613 and 1614, is the lowest region on earth. As stated earlier, for Christian Byzantium, the loss of the true cross was the heaviest blow in that defeat in Jerusalem, located near the shores of the Dead Sea. At 399 meters below sea level, the Dead Sea is the lowest place on Earth's surface. This means that the Byzantines were defeated at the lowest part of the world, just as stated in the verse. The most interesting point lies in the fact that the altitude of the Dead Sea could only be measured with modern measurement techniques. 
Before that, it was impossible for anyone to know that it was the lowest region on the surface of the earth. Yet, this region was stated to be the lowest point on the earth in the Quran. Hence, this provides another evidence that the Quran is divine revelation. Apart from the miraculous characteristic of the Qur'an, which we have looked into so far, it also has a mathematical miracle. An example of this is the numbers of repetitions of some of the words in the Qur'an. Some related words are surprisingly repeated the same number of times. Below are such words and the numbers of their repetitions in the Qur'an. The word day, yaum, is repeated 365 times in singular form, while its plural and dual forms, days, ayam, and yaumain, together are repeated 30 times. The number of repetitions of the word, month, shahad, is 12. The word payment or reward is repeated 117 times, while the expression forgiveness, muhfira, which is one of the basic moral principles of the Quran, is repeated exactly twice as many times. The number of times the words world, dunya, and hereafter, akhira, are repeated is also the same, 115. The statement of seven heavens, Sabaa Samawat, is repeated seven times. The creation of the heavens, Kalk al Samawat, is also repeated seven times. The word faith, Iman, without genitive, is repeated 25 times throughout the Quran, as is also the word infidelity or covering over the truth, Kufr. The words paradise and hell are each repeated 77 times. The word Satan, Shaitan, is used in the Quran 88 times, as is the word angels, Malaika. The word Zakah is repeated 32 times, while the number of repetitions of the word blessing, Baraka, is also 32. The words man and woman are also employed equally, 23 times. Sun, Shams, and Light, Nur, both appear 33 times in the Qur'an. In counting the word light, only the simple forms of the words were included. The expression, the righteous, al-abrar, is used six times, but the wicked, al-fujar, is used half as much, i.e. three times. Human being is used 65 times. The sum of the number of mentions of the stages of man's creation is the same, i.e., Human being, 65, soil, turab, 17, drop of sperm, nutfah, 12, embryo, alak, 6, half-formed lump of flesh, mudgah, 3, bone, idham, 15, flesh, lahm, 12. The word land appears 13 times in the Quran, and the word sea, 32 times giving a total of 45 references. If we divide that number by that of the number of references to the land, we arrive at the figure 28.88888888889%. The number of total references to land and sea, 45, divided by the number of references to the sea in the Quran, 32, is 71.11111111111%. Extraordinarily, these figures represent the exact proportions of land and sea on the earth today. Every piece of information shows us an apparent fact. The Qur'an is such a book 
that all the news related in it has proved to be true, and facts that no one could ever have known at the time were announced in its verses. Certainly this proves clear evidence that the Qur'an is not the word of man. The Qur'an is the word of God, the originator of everything, and the Almighty who encompasses everything with his knowledge. In a verse, God remarks on the Qur'an. If it had been from other than God, they would have found many inconsistencies in it. Not only are there no inconsistencies in the Qur'an, every piece of information it contains reveals the miracle of this divine book more and more each day. What falls to man is to hold fast to this divine book revealed by God and receive it as his one and only guide. In one of the verses, God tells us the following. And this is a book we have sent down and blessed. So follow it and have fear of God so that hopefully you will gain mercy. This film is based on Harun Yahya's book, The Miracles of the Qur'an.